If you've ever tried to taper off of an SSRI, you may have assumed that cutting the dose in half cuts the effect in half. But that assumption is exactly why so many people run into trouble when they try to come off of these medications. I'm making this video because as a physician and health coach who helps people to taper off of their medications prior to psilocybin therapy, I've met too many people who don't quite understand how these medications work and how to come off of them safely. Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Kim Townsend. I'm a licensed medical doctor. I'm also a licensed psilocybin facilitator, and I teach about the healing potential of psychedelics and help people to access these medicines safely. As always, this content is for educational purposes only. In this video, we'll walk through the most common mistake that people make when discontinuing their SSRI antidepressant medication, the science of serotonin transporters, which is the site of action for these medications, what hyperbolic tapering means, and towards the end, I'll share an emerging idea about using psychedelic microdosing as what is called a bridge therapy. It's experimental, but it could change everything we know about approaching this whole process. So stick around because once you understand how all of this works and this new possibility of microdosing, you'll see tapering in a completely different light. Most people assume that antidepressant tapering is simple math. If you cut the dose in half, your brain experiences half the effect. And it feels logical, it's neat, it's the way that most people conceptualize this process, but that's not how the brain and these medications actually interact. So to understand why, let's first look at the neuronal synapse. So the synapse is the tiny meeting point between two neurons. On one side, we have the presynaptic neuron. So this is the neuron that releases the neurotransmitters like serotonin into the gap, which is also known as the synaptic cleft. And on the other side of the synapse, we have the postsynaptic neuron, which has receptors to catch the neurotransmitters. Once the neurotransmitter nestles into the receptor like a lock and key mechanism, this triggers a signaling cascade downstream into the postsynaptic neuron to pass the message along. Once the message is delivered, most of the serotonin is then recycled by special pumps called serotonin transporters, or CERT, S-E-R-T, which lie on the surface of the presynaptic neuron. SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, act on these serotonin transporters. So when you take an SSRI, the medication sits on that pump and blocks it. So serotonin stays in the synaptic cleft for longer. And here's the key point. The relationship between the amount of medication that you take and how many serotonin transporters the medication blocks is not linear. It's hyperbolic or curved. The graph that relates the amount of medication taken to the percentage of serotonin transporters occupied is called the SERT or CERT occupancy curve. Here's the CERT occupancy curve for sertraline or Zoloft from the Maudsley Deprescribing textbook. Notice how the line shoots up steeply to the right at the beginning. So at a low dose of just 25 milligrams, about 70% of serotonin transporters are already occupied. The drug has what we call high affinity for its target. And doubling the dose doesn't double the effect, it only blocks it a little bit more. So as we go up to higher doses, the effect is only marginally greater. And that's why we see the curve flattening out. So going from 25 milligrams to 50 milligrams, doesn't double the effect. It only nudges the percentage of serotonin transporter occupancy by about 10% up to roughly 80%. And then doubling the dose again to 100 milligrams brings it up only another five percentage points to around 85% occupancy. Now that you understand this curve, the next question then becomes, how does this translate to real life tapering? And this is where most people's intuitions can lead them astray. The natural assumption is that tapering should be linear, and most people want to make only small adjustments in the beginning. But when you look at the CERT occupancy curve, you can see why that doesn't really make sense or work. At the higher doses, you can actually make larger reductions without much impact. You can go from 100 milligrams down to 80, and the curve barely moves. You don't lose much transporter occupancy. And most people don't feel a dramatic difference at this point in the curve. So it's fine when you're at the beginning of a taper, but then at the lower doses, the curve gets steep. So dropping from say 50 milligrams to 30 milligrams or from 20 milligrams to zero means a massive change in transporter occupancy. Each step towards the end can feel like falling off a cliff. So what most people get wrong is treating every reduction the same. 
the early reductions are relatively forgiving. It's the later reductions where the body can feel bigger shifts. And that's why withdrawal symptoms often appear towards the end of a taper. This is the counterintuitive truth. Bigger steps are often possible at the beginning, but the steps have to get smaller and smaller as you approach the end. And this is the foundation for hyperbolic tapering. Hyperbolic just means that each dose reduction gets smaller and smaller as you move down. In practice, this often means using liquid formulations, taper strips, or compounding pharmacies to make those very small reductions towards the end possible. Hyperbolic tapering is the gold standard, but what if there are ways to support the nervous system even more during those final, most sensitive steps? That's where these newer ideas are starting to emerge, and that's the use of psilocybin microdosing as a bridge therapy. A bridge therapy is a temporary supportive treatment used to smooth the transition between two phases of treatment. For example, microdosing to help stabilize mood and ease withdrawal symptoms while tapering off of an antidepressant medication. The rationale here is that very small subperceptual doses of psilocybin might support the nervous system during those final doses of tapering, helping with mood stability and emotional flexibility as serotonin transporter occupancy is changing. Microdosing could also provide a gentle boost in neuroplasticity, giving the brain more adaptability while withdrawal symptoms are at their highest risk of showing up. So you can think of it like softening the landing as you come off those final doses of your medication, giving your nervous system extra support in that transition phase. But it's important to be extremely clear, this approach is still experimental. There aren't any large clinical trials yet, and it's not a standard part of de-prescribing guidelines. For now, it's just a promising idea being explored at the frontiers of medicine with self-experimenters and biohackers, basically the clients that we have at my practice called Meadow. If you're interested in learning more about this process, you can book a free discovery call at our website, www.meadowmedicine.org, which is linked in the video description below. So whether microdosing becomes a mainstream tool or remains an experimental one, here's the main takeaway. Understanding the CERT occupancy curve shows why most tapers can fail. Hyperbolic tapering gives us a science-backed strategy, and bridge therapies like microdosing hint at what's possible in the future. Putting this all together means that tapering doesn't have to feel like guesswork. It can be a guided process that respects your biology and opens up new possibilities for healing. The key here is patience and flexibility, and of course, seeking proper support and guidance. If this video was helpful, please do like, subscribe, and comment. It helps our channel to grow. And visit the website if you're interested in learning about how to get support for yourself in this process. And follow me for more education about psychedelics and your health.